Daikon. It's been I've been there with all the sessions. I mean, right from its conception, and it's always a pleasure. So thank you, Dr. Bansi and whole team for giving this opportunity. I think Dr. Tejas has made my task pretty easy. He's talked about practically all the trials that have been involved with apagliflozin. I'm going to talk to uh, try and focus about heart failure in a CKD aspect. Uh, this is a very common coexisting comorbidity. Patients would have a uh, lot of patients with CKD would have heart failure. A lot of heart patient heart failure patient would have either a CKD or an acute worsening of a pre-existing CKD in diabetic patients. Now, type two diabetes is a continuum of a disorder which includes not only cardiovascular but also renal disorder, which are uh, uh, interlinked and interconnected to a huge extent because of the AGEs, lipids. Uh, blood pressure, ROS, inflammation, fibrosis, sympathetic nervous stimulation, RAS activation, and each can induce each other's dysfunction. CKD impacts 1 in 10 globally, which is uh, almost 2.6 million plus actually require renal replacement therapy with accounting for 1.2 million deaths annually. And this is estimated to increase to 5 million by 2030. And many developing uh, countries are spending 2 to 3% of their annual budget on end-stage disease management, and 42% of this is accounted purely by diabetic. And if you had hypertensive, this would be another 18%. So majority of CKD management strategy would still be focusing again around you know, diabetes and hypertension management. If you look at it in India also, stage 5 diagnosed CKDs constitute majority, almost 50%. And if you include uh, type 4, stage 4, and they would be three-fourths of the population. With diabetic subgroup, however, this stage would be even more around accounting. If you were in include stage three, they would stage three, four, and five would be more than 90%. So 16.4% of adult population has one or the other stage of CKD. And more than 2 lakh patients are on dialysis with almost 5,000 dialysis centers now across India. So both lower EGFR and development of albuminuria are associated with increased CV mortality. There have been papers uh, from the Lancet way back almost a decade now, which talks about CV mortality uh, uh, according to EGFR. Uh, with or without diabetes, we can see that as the EGFR goes down, the hazards go up. And the CV mortality according to the uh, uh, diabetic or non-diabetic status for the ACR also has a linear correlation. So we know now from the therapeutic intervention from the various aspects, from preventing new onset and worsening renal function, it's been limited. We had good data from Ramipril and RAIN study, which talked about non-diabetic nephropathy uh, way back in 1907. And since then, only IRBs are the only group, uh, almost a decade now, which they showed 2011, that you can uh, halt the progression of renal worsening by using RBs by IDNT, renal and roadmap trial, uh, respectively for irbisartan. Losartan and Olmisartan. Now, remember, these again were diabetic subgroup, and uh, that's why people preferred to use uh, uh, ARBs over ACE in patients who were diabetic nephropathy. However, this is primarily driven because of the different designs of the clinical trial. However, aliskerin, sodoxide, uh, even anti inflammatory agents like bardoxolone or even combinations in dual RAS inhibition all have failed miserably. SGLT2, however, has now given a new benefit. Glucose lowering not only in improves the microvascular uh, uh, outcomes, but decreases glucotoxicity and risk of hypoglycemia. In insulin-dependent independent mechanism, it has the ability to work at all stages and can be combined with other anti-hypoglycemic agents. So osmotic uh, diuresis, which can lead to initial weight loss, then decrease in blood pressure. The sustained weight loss and mitigation of weight gain is the other benefit that this therapy has. And remember that when you lose a weight, for the same lower weight for the corresponding EG, uh, for the corresponding uh, creatinine in your EGFR also tends to alter. And on top of that, you are still able to achieve an EGFR decline uh, being prevented with these class of therapy, as I'll take you through the further slides. So, multiple glycemic and extra glycemic benefits of dapagliflozin have been looked on top of addition of metformin uh, 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 in various trials, right from the baseline EGFR of 7.9 to 9.4, and you can see A1C goes down by 24 weeks by almost 1.5. When you add monotherapy or to uh, uh, compare that with the addition of metformin or SU or DPP4, the additional benefits in inadequately controlled diabetic and hypertensive patient, you derive benefit ranging from 1 to 3.4 kg of weight loss. And Weber studies have shown that in patients with inadequately controlled uh, 
uh, patient's diapagliflozin uh, reduces blood pressure by 10 millimeters of mercury. And uh, when you look at the other study, when you had existing ASARB and other antihypertensive, even then dapagliflozin was able to lower blood pressure by 11 millimeters of mercury, which was 4 millimeter more than placebo. And this is very significant. And that was the reason ever since in the Diacon's first debate that I had, and I was the only odd man out as a cardiologist debating that dapagliflozin was a cardiologist molecule. And so, I mean, it was just for the sake of debate and now it's become so true. And what Dr. Tejas was saying, I uh, he, that cardiologist woke up, I think at least I can claim that I was awake even before that. So evidence for expanding the role of SGLT2 to fill the vacuum in CKD has now been driven by the potential benefit that it can derive both from the direct as well as downstream effect on the kidney function. As CKD progresses, elevated Ig intraglomerular pressure is the common feature and driver, we all know, and the tubular feedback is one that's restored by SGLT2 by inhibiting glucose absorption proximally, also blocking uh, and leading to inc increased distal delivery of sodium to the macula densa and hence uh, TGF restoration results in decreased glomerular hyperfiltration and hydrostatic pressure. So restoration of TGF, which is tubular glomerular feedback, is an important parameter that drives uh, prevention, prevents the intraglomerular hypertension and proteinuria. So decreased my uh, urinary albumin may produce a reduced pro-inflammatory pathway and direct toxicity and improve cardiac function and increase hematocrit hence may result in increased oxygen delivery to kidney and improvement in renal hypoxia. So this was already shown by Dr. Tejas how DPAS, DAPA CKD had a trial design of including adults with EGFR between 25 to 75 and USCR between 200 to 5000 and they were already on stable tolerated ASRB without uh, or with, uh, with diabetes uh, excluding type 1 diabetes, uh, ADPKD, Anka associated vasculitis or patients on immunosuppressive therapy and they were randomized to look at the end point of composite of decline in GG, EGFR and stage disease or renal or CV death. Now baseline characteristics you had one third females and uh, we had 68 percent type 2 diabetics and 58 uh, percent of them were actually diabetic nephropathy and as was shown uh, only 19 patients needed to be treated over a period of 32 months we have 39% reduction in primary endpoint, which included a hard endpoint of death. When you look at the ex uh, exploratory outcome of dialysis, transplant, or renal death, even then, DAPA 10 milligrams reduced it over 32 weeks by 34%. Uh, even CV death or heart failure hospitalization, which I believe are a robust and a strong endpoint, because why do you treat anything? You treat them primarily to prevent death. You treat diabetes not for the number's sake. You treat them to prevent outcomes. And that outcome reduction can only be done by hard endpoints like diabetes or by mortality measurements. And that also as a combined endpoint with hospitalization was reduced by 29%. All cause mortality was reduced by 31%. So that's the most important therapy, therapeutic aspect. I'm not sure if we have enough trials to tell us uh, about other therapies in CKD patients that can tell you that uh, when you treat CKD patients with something, maybe safe abogazostat, maybe with um, allopurinol, maybe with uh, all the kind of alkalotic regimes that are prescribed and all kind of amino acids that are prescribed or all the kind of ketalog, et cetera, that are given, whether do they alter the outcome in CKD? Probably no. What about the erythropoietin therapies? Do they alter the outcome? Probably no. But uh, they may alter the outcomes and soft endpoints, but not the all-cause mortality. All-cause mortality is a very important driver. And when anything that reduces death, it should be the first line therapy and chosen ahead of a lot of other aspects. Again, when you look at the primary outcome uh, by diabetic status, whether the patient is diabetic or non-diabetic, and this is really something that should drive attention to all uh, uh, physicians and all endocrinologists or all physicians, um, non-diabetic patients also reduce that at CKD reduction by 50% uh, primary endpoint reduction. So uh, again, just like DAPA HF, you had DAPA CKD telling us that the, whether you're diabetic or not, giving the SGLT2 therapy with DAPA gliflozin inhibition of SGLT2, you could actually achieve hard endpoint reduction. Again, this was shown by Dr. Tejas how overall population diabetic nephropathy was 86% in uh, diabetics naturally, but in the non-diabetics, it was chronic glomerular nephritis and even hypertensive nephropathy, which constituted huge subgroup and still had good outcomes. Again, Ig and nephropathy was the explorative data and number of participants in the clinical trials in DAPA-CKD 
uh, with IgA nephropathy was uh, significant compared to a stop IgA, etc. And the primary outcome, again, was hugely beneficial, 71% relativism reduction with curves diverging as early as first year. So this again tells you that even in benign disorders which are genetically uh, uh, driven, which are not so much driven by the acquired disorder like Ig and nephropathy, even there the mechanism or mechanistic benefits that one can derive are uh, shown by dapagliflozin. Again, I believe that nephrologists should start making noise like us cardiologists that this is our molecule. So primary and secondary outcome by baseline CVD when you compare overall uh, for the EGFR decline and the primary endpoint or the secondary endpoints with or without CVD. In patients with CVD, actually secondary outcomes were better. But across the whole subgroup, it's a therapy that has a class effect across the various subgroup of patients. Again, with or without heart failure, because a lot of people tended to have this argument that the driven events were primarily in patients who had overt heart failure. But remember, a lot of CKD interplay exists with heart failure. And in patients who did not have a baseline heart failure, even then, dapagliflozin in CKD patients improve the primary outcome. So the effect of a uh, 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 baseline characteristic, irrespective whether the patient had heart failure or not, the, all the outcomes, including all-cause death, were significantly reduced uh, uh, in all across the spectrum with the pre-specified -expo pre exploratory outcome of first heart failure hospitalization also being reduced. So uh, uh, the DAPA data in average EGFR of 85 patient in DACLAR to me when you retrospectively try to analyze, we already had signals there. And that's why this trial was designed. In patients from normal micro to progression to macro albuminuria was also reduced much significantly by dapagliflozin. And same was the case from normal to micro and macro or normal to micro from micro to or micro to macro progression. And this is uh, again favoring dapagliflozin in, across the outcome. Again, not only that it prevented progression, there is evidence that showed regression, which means Patient who already had macro albuminuria, they actually moved to now have micro or normal albuminuria. So this is again something which is we have never encountered previously with any other class of therapy. The landmark trial uh, has hence shown that the mean age of this patient was 66, 76% were male. You had 24, 24% approximately Asian represented in this. BMI of 28, rate of uh, 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 less than 60 a mean EGFR being 41%, NYHA class, you can see majority were class 2, EF mean was 31%, mean NT-pro BNP was elevated, and 45% were diabetic, heart failure hospitalization in DAPA-HF for 47%, and AF was 38%. So in DAPA-HF also, when you look overall, the significant reduction of composite endpoint of death and heart failure hospitalization was 26%, and this was primarily driven by 18% of CV death reduction which again goes on to tell us that, again, uh, DAPA has turned probably table in heart failure on empagliflozin because empareg outcome, they talk about mortality, which was not so significantly encountered, though there are different trial designs and different kinds of patient in both. But DAPA HF has shown that probably for heart failure, the data is more robust for this molecule. So this is consistent uh, a benefit across the group, whether the patient was diabetic or not, whatever was the baseline EF, 90 pro BNP, GFR diuretic use, and they cause reduction in first event of hospitalization and death and significant risk uh, reduction of uh, heart failure as early as first 28 days. So this is the retrospective uh, analysis and plotting. And you can see that the first benefit of uh, was noted at significance in the first 28 days with reduction of hazards by half. And this was statistically significant. So when you start dapagli flows into your patient, you're preventing in a heart failure, you're preventing that even as early as first month. Again, this is very robust. New onset of diabetes without a baseline diabetes was reduced by 32%. Again, this goes on to show that patients of heart failure are prone to develop diabetes over a long period of time. And this can be prevented uh, even if their baseline A1C was by 5.7 to 6.4 it reduced it by 32%. Even ventricular arrhythmia resuscitated cardiac arrest and sudden death were reduced in DAPA-HF, uh, which, uh, which was 64%. Resuscitated cardiac arrest were 3 and ventricular arrhythmia was 33%. And when you look at this, it was 21% relative risk reduction as compared to placebo arm. So what are the current guidelines? We look at the ASN algorithm, which talks about uh, type 2 diabetic and CKD. When you look at the TMIRA score and calculate the same, if USCR is more than 300, SGLT2 is the first inhibitor that you should be choosing. If 
EGFR is below 30, you can go to a GLP-1 analog. If the patient is high risk, you can add the combination. And then the inhibition uh, by the dual pathway is preferred. Uh, you can also look at the USCR in the lower range and even that subgroup. If EGFR is more than 30, go with an SGLT2, which more go by uh, GLP-1 analog and again, modifying and the combining the same. Uh, physical activity, nutrition, weight loss in the KIDGO guideline also talk about metformin. If EGFR is below 45, you need to reduce the dose, stop it below 30. SGLT2, you did not initiate below 30 and GLP-1 analogs again preferred. Again, some guideline updates which have come, ACE, ARB, MRA, uh, ARNI, and then SGLT2 has been talked about in sequencing. But a lot of times now there are expert consensus proposals uh, by John McMurray's group, which talks about initiating beta blocker and SGLT2 as first one because it allows you to rapid up titration of therapy and adding ARNI later and then the MRA. The profiling and heart failure for tailoring therapy hence would go by heart rate, blood pressure, atrial fibrillation and CKD and all these therapies can be accommodated in the same group. So C uh, SGLT2 scores uh, much better uh, in the CKD subarm. SGLT2 beta blocker diuretic verisigua, isocybidinitrate are some of the new therapies that have been talked about in patients with low GEFR. But in patients who have hyperkalemia, SGLT2 would still be a good choice. Uh, in ESC guidelines, again, management of reduced ejection fraction talks about all these therapy, ICD for patients with EF less than 35 and QRS is wide, uh, then you probably think of CRTD. DAPA glyphosate, hence, because of the declared DAPA, HF, and DAPA, CKD, it covers all across the spectrum with a good, significant, proven primary endpoint reduction across the class. Thank you very much for patient hearing. These are the pro monographs uh, uh, and the disclosures. Thank you very much. Over to Jay.